Hi everyone, my name is Noa Lubin. I'm a data scientist working in diagnostic robotics. And today we're gonna to talk about how we can harness data in order to improve healthcare. So I wanna start by a famous quote by Walter Cronkite, who was a famous journalist in the US. And he says, America's healthcare system is neither healthy, caring, nor a system. So of course he's exaggerating, but we know that the healthcare system in the US and in Israel as well, suffers from inefficiency and uh, doesn't reach all patients. So we at Diagnostic Robotics are making AI uh, tools in order to make healthcare more effective, efficient, and affordable. We're about 100 data scientists, engineers, designers, uh, physicians working together in order to make these AI-based solutions. And here you can see the founders of the startup and the medical advisory board. Um, so we have two main problems we're trying to solve at Diagnostic Robotics. The first one is an AI augmented home-based triage. And the second one is a population health AI solution. And in this talk, we're gonna focus on the population health AI solution. So um, imagine that we could predict patients who have a high likelihood to be hospitalized and then um, match these patients into an intervention plan. And uh, by matching these patients to the intervention plan, potentially avoid the next hospitalization of this patient. So this is what we dream and do at Diagnostic Robotics. We build a system that ranks patients uh, from most likely to least likely to have a hospitalization. And uh, the, high, the top ranked patients are the ones that are matched into inter, an intervention program. So now we're gonna see how we solve this population health AI solution. Um, so first of all, you might wonder what are the data sources we're using? So we have billions of historical medical visits, which is a huge potential for AI. And um, we work with claims data. So what are claims data? If you're now a patient in the US and you just went to visit a doctor um, and you had several pr procedures, for example, um, a, a CT uh, test, so uh, you will then claim your refund from the insurance company uh, that will say that you visited a doctor, that you have the CT scan and, and everything that was in this uh, doctor's visit. Uh, this claims data go to the insurance company and this is the data we're working on. So we have information about procedures, diagnosis, uh, pharmaceuticals, and sometimes even lab tests. And from that, we try to build this predictive model. So we're, we'll start focusing on the claims data and then we'll later talk about the intervention data. Um, so not only we rank uh, chronic patients, we, we can divide the outcomes we're working on at Diagnostic Robotics into two majorly. The first one is avoidable visits, visits that could have been treated in primary care instead of the emergency room, for example, and preventable hospitalizations usually. These are conditions that if uh, had been taken care of, wouldn't deteriorate into an hospitalization. So in this talk, we're going to focus on preventable outcomes, uh, which again uh, are conditions that we try to treat in order that they won't deteriorate into another hospitalization. Um, so we said we have this claims data, which are um, billions of, co of medical codes of procedure, diagnosis, and pharmaceuticals. Uh, one way to approach this kind of data is to treat it as a time series data and embed it. And I highly encourage you in your company, if you have a time series data, uh, to try to treat it uh, uh, in an embedded way. So what did we do? We have these billions of medical codes and we can see it as a timeline. Uh, we have the code and when did this code appear? Um, then we did some medical clustering. So we took these codes and uh, by uh, some medical ontologies, uh, group them into higher hierarchy of procedures, diagnosis, and pharmaceuticals. 
And then we divided these medical codes into timeline per patient. So we uh, can treat each patient uh, individually as its own timeline. So if you're aware of word embeddings from the NLP domain, and the timeline per, per patient is kind of how we divide the data into sentences because each patient now represents uh, a new uh, um, time series to embed. And on top of that, we can use any open source tools such as word to vec and, and in order to embed uh, the, the, the medical codes. So here you can see, for example, the results of the embedding. So uh, one way to evaluate the embedding is to pick a few examples and, and to see if there uh, is a similarity maintained between uh, 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 the embeddings and the, its nearest neighbor. So here you can see PTCA, which is a procedure related to the heart and all the other procedures, diagnosis and pharmaceuticals, you can see that there were um, the nearest neighbor of this procedure are uh, in the same semantic context of a, a heart uh, failure. So um, here you can see that uh, our uh, medical codes kind of went to med school and they learned uh, how to, uh, to capture the meaning of the procedures, uh, diagnosis and pharmaceuticals. So once we have this code embeddings, uh, we built um, a sequential model um, and we used uh, the sequential model to evaluate how well we perform based on traditional uh, uh, machine learning models such as logistic regression. And here you can see on the left um, the precision at the top K of the list of the ranked patients from K ranging from 1 to 10. And you can see that the traditional logistic regression models always perform much worse than our sequential deep learning models that use the medical code embeddings we just saw. And I highly encourage you to read our paper. And I can send the link later if someone is interested. So now, not only do we have this very good prediction of which patients are going to be hospitalized, we give these predictions to case managers. Those case managers try to reach the patient and engage them into intervention programs that are supposed to um, prevent the next hospitalization. So in order for the case managers to work with our models, we have to make our models explainable. We have to make uh, sure that the case managers trust our model and can work with our model in order to convince the patients to join the program. So uh, there are a few challenges to this problem in the healthcare domain. Uh, so the first challenge is a more general challenge that we're using co complex models. We talked about the sequential deep learning architecture that we are using. Uh, and this is a challenge general to explainability, but we also see it here. Uh, another challenge is that we have some non-interpretable features. For example, our medical code embeddings. Our medical code embeddings, as they are, are not interpretable. We can use attention mechanisms to learn uh, what's uh, hidden behind them, but still these are features that are very hard to interpret, or, to interpret for the case manager. And, and the third point is that some features are too detailed for the case manager. So for example, uh, the model might be interested in separating if the patient had an MRI in the past three months versus the last six months, but for the case manager, this is too much detail. So we thought about how, solve, how to solve this problem and the solution we came up with is a surrogate model. So uh, what does the surrogate model mean? This is a model that uh, is trained separately from the ranking model, but this model tries to imitate as close as possible the ranking model. So what is the, uh, how does it work? So we have, our black score, uh, black box, sorry, model scores that map um, the features into a prediction of the likelihood of a patient to be hospitalized. And then we have this medical selection and clustering of the features. So all the features we wanted to be removed or features we wanted to group are transformed in, into a way from X to X tilde. 
Uh, and now we train a model, the surrogate model, uh, and the loss of the model is now trying to mimic the Y hat, the predictions of the original model, working with the features uh, after the transformation with X still the features. And this model now has a new prediction. And we, uh, at the bottom, you can see two ways to measure how well is the surrogate model compared to the black box model. And we can measure, first of all, an R, R square distance between the predictions of one model and the other. But since it's, in our case, it's a ranking model, um, a better uh, measurement can be Candle's tau uh, that you can see below, the number of concurrent pairs, the number of pairs that uh, the ranking between them remained uh, correct, and the number of discordant pairs, the, uh, minus the number of discordant pairs, the number of pairs whose ranking changed, divided by the total number of pairs. So uh, we can evaluate how well this surrogate model imitated our original model. So what are the advantages of, of this solution? Is first that it's model agnostic. I can build any model as my black box model. And um, now for the surrogate model, I can choose any model I want, an interpretable one, obviously. And I can choose the features I want to present to the case managers. And it's a relatively simple solution. So again, I highly encourage you, if at your company you do need a solution uh, for an end client to interpret your model, and you have very complex features and complex models, this is one of the solutions uh, that we found useful. Um, now for the next topic. So we have this ranking models who are explainable. We also want them to be fair. So fairness is a very broad subject in the uh, domain of artificial intelligence. And uh, now we're, I'm going to tell you what we did uh, at this system in order to improve it. So um, first of all, in order to understand fairness, we have to understand that fairness is subjective. There is no one uh, metric that can evaluate if our model is fair or not, because it highly depends on what we defined is fair. For example, uh, one person can say equality is fair and the other one will say equity is fair. And another thing to, to, to see the difference is that we can compare uh, individual fairness and how fair we were on this specific individual. And we can look at group fairness. Are we fair on a general um, attributes of a group? Um, so, uh, you, so again, fairness is subjective. And before you address fairness, you need to understand what it is that you, are, you want to measure and improve. So uh, we focused on group fairness to see that our models uh, on a certain attributes of a group, such as uh, race or gender, is uh, behaving in a fair way. Um, so where does bias come from into our models? So surprise, surprise, it's coming from us, human beings. Uh, it's everywhere. It's in our data. Uh, so the sample of the data we train our models on. It's in the reporting of the data. It can be in the way we label the data while we train the model. And there, are, um, there is a survey that uh, lists over 40 types of biases that we can inject uh, um, uh, un subconsciously into our models. And, and in this talk, since we're limited on time, I'm, fo I'm gonna focus on label bias. So what is label bias? Um, it's a bias that we uh, uh, induce into our model by uh, the way we define the outcome we're trying to predict. Um, so uh, how does it look, uh, the fairness in ranking systems? So here you can see, for example, um, three ranking systems that if we look at the precision at the top 10 uh, patients, the precision at the top 10 patients is similar um, um, but uh, you can see that the first rank uh, favors males at the top uh, five, and uh, the, the right one is uh, more fair since it, uh, it uh, ranks males, females in an intervened way. Um, so uh, you can see that in ranking system, the order in which you uh, present the information is very important. Um, and uh, bias in healthcare is uh, 
is famous just as in bias in other uh, machine learning tools. I, I'm sure you must have heard about the biases in uh, Amazon tool to, um, uh, for CV screening, uh, Microsoft uh, bot who became racist and all of other different things. So here um, there is a research of, the, uh, of uh, the racial bias in algorithms to manage healthcare population. Um, uh, this is a research we took into diagnostic robotics and tried to avoid. Um, so here you can see, for example, um, in the graph below, the x-axis is the percentile of algorithm risk score. So the closer you are to 100, the higher likelihood to, you have to be hospitalized. And the y-axis is the number of active chronic conditions. And uh, the purple line indicates um, African Americans and the, uh, the orange one, uh, white uh, individuals. And you can see that, for example, for the same risk score, let's say 80, um, in order to be ranked 80, an African American person has to have a lot more chronic conditions uh, than uh, a white person. So this is something we try to avoid. And we want this graph uh, to, to um, merge as, as, uh, as much as we can. There's also always a trade-off between uh, being biased and having the best performance in terms of precision, recall, et cetera. Um, and we try to find the best uh, trade-off uh, uh, that works uh, for us. So um, how can we measure bias in ranking system? So uh, one of the way we can measure bias is by a normalized discounted Kale diverg divergence matrix. So um, for those of you who need a, a recap on what's Kale divergence, uh, it's a metric that measures how far are one distributions for, from another. This is the formula you can see here below. And what the normalized discounted Kale divergence does is that it goes through the list of the ranked patients and, and, and looks at the top 10, then at the top 20, for example, and so on. We, we decide uh, the skip uh, uh, frequency. And then uh, we measure the Kale divergence at each and every step. So intuitively, this can measure how an arbitrary distribution is away from the true distribution in multiple cases uh, of the ranking system. And in our case of bias, the distribution can be uh, the distribution of the protected attribute, for example, race or gender in one ranking, in, in our ranking, compared to this distribution in the real world. And we want to see that these distributions are as close as possible. So uh, the closer that we are to the number zero, the more fair we are. Um, so a reminder again that our outcomes and diagnostic robotics are preventable uh, hospitalizations and uh, hospitalizations that can be avoided. And here we wanted to see that how our outcome not only is uh, business uh, uh, friendly because these are conditions that can be prevented. There is no uh, need to predict, for example, conditions that we cannot help from preventing. But so not only is this useful, but it also reduces the bias. And this is the experiment we conducted here. So you can see uh, uh, the comparison of uh, simple models such as logistic regression and our model and um, the label which we train on, which is general hospitalization versus preventable hospitalizations. And here you can see the normalized discounted Kale divergence. Uh, for, um, now here we tested gender bias, so female versus male. And you can see that um, our model with the outcome of preventable hospitalization has the lowest um, normalized discounted Kale divergence, which is, uh, means that it has uh, uh, the least bias. And you can see uh, the gap here that uh, by using the preventable hospitalization, we significantly reduce the bias um, because we chose a label that uh, uh, removes the bias of uh, noise. Obviously, uh, women have more hospitalization. For example, women give birth. After giving birth, you need to be hospitalized. So uh, by 
by a, a building a label of preventable hospitalization, we reduce the, bi the gender bias. Um, so I, uh, here I showed you how we can measure bias in ranking system. I think it's very important where you work uh, that you take into account uh, biases and fairness in your uh, AI-based algorithms. Um, so now uh, at the beginning we talk about we have these billions of historical medical visits and we talked about claims data, how we build these predictive models and, and and we rank patients, we make them explainable, we make them fair, we make them the best that they can be. And I wanna to talk to you about a different source of data and how we use it to improve our models, uh, the intervention program data. So we said that uh, um, in order to prevent the next hospitalization, a patient will um, be matched into an intervention program. An intervention program can be um, any program that monitors the patient's health, that recommends some suggestion, uh, that sends medical equipment to his or her home. Um, so there are many different types of intervention. And the data we have is when someone uh, went into this intervention and uh, did it complete it, yes or no. And with this data, I wanna show you what we can do in the um, artificial intelligence world. And now we're gonna go into the domain of uh, causal machine learning. Um, so first, before we go into the machine learning, uh, let's understand how nowadays or how usually uh, we evaluate an intervention in the medical world. So you might have heard of the term randomized control trial. This is how we do it in the medical world. We take a group of people and let's say, for example, we want to see how COVID vaccination it uh, reduces the number of respiratory hospitalizations. So our, hy our hypothesis is that COVID vaccination reduces the number of um, uh, respiratory hospitalizations. So we take a group of people, we divide it randomly into two. One group receives the intervention, so for example, the COVID vaccine, and the other group doesn't or receives a placebo. And then we um, uh, compare the average patient outcome in each and every group. So let's say Y1 is the, outcome, the average outcome of the intervention group and Y0 is the outcome of the control group. And in each group, uh, there was a different number of hospitalization. And now we measure what's called the average treatment effect, which is the expectancy of the difference of the outcomes in the two groups. And this can indicate if the vaccine did work or not. Um, so what is the major problem of causal inference? Is that for each patient, we can only observe one of the two outcomes. Not a single person in the world can have at the same time receive and not receive a COVID vaccination. Um, and I want to ask you if we can simply compare the hospitalizations of patients that did receive COVID vaccine to patients who didn't uh, in a non-randomized control setup. Can I go back to the data retrospectively and compare uh, patients who received the vaccine as opposed to those who didn't? Um, so the answer is no. And in order to emphasize how bad this can be, I wanna take you back to January, 2021 in Israel, for example, that only um, people over 60 with, uh, or with comorbidities received the COVID vaccine. So if we were to compare the number of uh, respiratory hospitalization of the group that did receive the vaccine to those who didn't, we could have ended up with the wrong conclusions that COVID vaccine it causes more respiratory hospitalization because of the group that was older and sicker. So we need to make sure that uh, uh, with the groups we compare are as comparable as possible. So uh, the solution I'm proposing here is to emulate randomized control trial. So how do we do it? We turn the observational study into a pseudo randomized control trial. So if I go back to my data, I know which patients received the COVID vaccine, and these are the patients that I, I, I call now are in the treatment group. Um, now I want to find pay a comparable group of patients for every 
patient in the treatment group, I'm trying to look for the most identical twin uh, patient in the control group in terms of age, uh, chronic conditions, medical history, uh, social determinants, and so on. So I want to uh, find a, a, an identical twin uh, for each member in the treatment group in the control group. And um, uh, let's formulate this problem, okay? So we have what we call a confounders. Confounders are the features that affect both the outcome and receiving the treatment. So um, uh, they affect both the outcome Y, preventable hospitalizations, and uh, the, the reason that the patient received the treatment, for example, COVID vaccine. And um, uh, the treatment also affects the outcome, obviously. Um, so the evaluation method we can do after matching the patients is that there is no statistical significance between the two groups for each and every important confounder. Um, so how can we find this long lost twin? How can we do this matching? So let's start by a simple solution. We can do a, a, a simple matching by measuring the Euclidean distance uh, between uh, two patients. So let's say, for example, we have only two features for a patient. One is the age and the other is the Charleston comorbidity index, which indicates how sick the person is. And we have those members from the treatment group in red. And for every member in red, we look at the Euclidean distance, how far, uh, um, what is the nearest neighbor of a patient that did not receive the treatment. And then we can uh, match the nearest neighbor to, from the treatment group into the control group and measure the average treatment effect of, uh, of the treatment group as compared to the control group. Uh, but this uh, naive solution uh, assumes that we give to each feature the same importance, the same weight. Um, and why should we do that? Uh, when we have machine learning tools that know better to build the formula uh, to, to, um, to give the importance of the features. So here's one of the solution, is what we call propensity score matching. So in propensity score matching, what we do is that we build a model, a machine learning model. It can be any model that you want from logistic regression to the most complex one. But now we don't try to predict the outcomes if a patient will have a hospitalization, but rather we try to predict if the patient will receive the treatment. So now we try to predict if a patient is likely to receive a COVID vaccination. And by doing that, we assume that uh, uh, the model is now, uh, the weights are uh, uh, learned so that we try to imitate the reasons that a doctor would send a patient into receiving treatment. And now we have the score that indicates how likely is this patient to receive the treatment. And by using this score, it can be a score or, or an embedded vector, we can now do a matching based on this score that captures the entire uh, confounders of the patient. So now that we have this score, we can do a simple uh, a nearest neighbor matching, for example, uh, from a patient from the treatment group into the control group based on this score. So for example, uh, the first one is matched with the last one and the second one with the third one. And um, the, the fourth one wasn't matched at all. It remains uh, out of the experiment. And then we can measure the average treatment effect of this um, uh, difference in outcome of the patient. So here I, I'm offering you a, a solution for COSA machine learning. I think it's very important for us to understand as data scientists, when is the problem uh, only based on correlations? And when a, causation, a causal effect uh, is entering our domain and we need to address causal solutions. And remember always that correlation does not imply causation. And in the medical world, it's super duper important. Um, so I hope you enjoyed this lecture. It was nice talking to you. Feel free to reach me out on my email for any question you have. And also we are hiring to several positions, so uh, you're welcome to send me your CVs as well. Have a nice day.